Hey everybody, my name is Chase Pipes and you're watching Chasing History, brought to you by the Smoky Mountain Relic Room and the American Digger Magazine. And we are in Heidelberg, Germany at the National Apothecary Museum here in the Heidelberg Castle inside of Germany. One thing that's really cool is when, as human beings, as we look at you know, the care of our cells, of our body through time. And this museum does a phenomenal job of displaying and showing that process. And, you know, having a pharmacy and, and someone, a profession, that that's their job. You know, where, that idea, where did it come from? Where did this idea come from in humankind of, you know, hey, we need somebody that that's all that they do is they, you know, take care of our bodies, they take care of our health, they figure out what plants to use, what medicines to use. You know, that, that idea has been with us for a long time. What's fascinating is, is the journey of that idea, of that science from an age of, you know, let's try something and see if it'll work to this is scientifically why this works and why this doesn't. So we're gonna take a tour through this museum. Hope you guys enjoy some neat stuff. The expression of the word pharmacy derives from the Greek word pharmakon, which basically means potion or, or you know, medicine. As diseases were originally often regarded as you know, punishment by the gods, priests besides the physicians were skilled in the arts of healing too and prepared the medication par partly with the aid of old established traditions. The antique system of medicine with its theories of diseases and the development methods of treatment also served as an important basis for the preparation of medicine. In the Middle Ages, this became an independent profession that would eventually be regulated by law. So after the fall of the Roman Empire, medical knowledge then moved to the places of literacy. They moved into the monasteries. You know, you got to think, and during the Roman world, pretty much everybody was literate. They could read or write. After the fall of Rome and Western civilization, you know, medical knowledge, you know, medical science, it had to go somewhere where it could be not only protected, but it can be, you know, built upon. And the one place that was where you had that were monasteries. Monasteries were hugely important in not only, you know, maintaining, you know, the stories of history, you know, some of our most important historical texts, you know, get brought from the Roman world into the modern one through the monasteries, but also medical knowledge as well. Because this is where the literate people were. If you, re if you could read, if you could write, you were in a monastery. Most everybody outside of a monastery, unless, you know, except with the exception of, the, of a king or of, you know, someone in his court, most everyday people weren't literate. So this is where pharmaceutical knowledge then moved to. Educated monks and nuns worked there both as doctors and preparators of medicine. A few of them, like Walfrid Strabo, circa 809 to 849 AD, and Hildred of Bidding, 1098 to 1179, increased the medical and pharmaceutical knowledge with their scripts. Medicinal plants were supplied by the monast mon monastic gardens. Relevant antique scripts were kept, studied, and copied in the monasteries. So basically meaning that, you know, any texts that, you know, survived, you know, the fall of Rome were kept by the monasteries. They were rewritten, they were studied, and then built upon. But also at this same time, there existed contacts with the Arabian Islamic medicine. So both had a lasting influence on the creation of future Occidental pharmacy. And it was out of this that the pharmaceutical trade began to flourish and grow into the early medieval world. In the Middle Ages, you had the rise of major epidemics and pandemics, you know, things like the Black Death and the Black Plague, you know, really affected, you know, human health worldwide, but it also affected the world of pharmacy. The Latin expression apotheca originally describes a storeroom for different goods. The apothecarius was its administrator. In German, the chemist and his shop have been called the apothecaker, and in pharmaceutical context in the 14th century. Um, Islamic models and the Occidental monasteries with their traditions of preparing medicine can be regarded as an important base for the creation of the independent profession of pharmacist. It is also a result of the rise of medical needs and problems of hygiene, you know, the academics we were talking about, in the growing medieval cities of the 13th and 14th century. The very first definition of pharmacy as a trade 
and a craft in a legal context is handed down by the Edict of Milf, a collection of laws for the Kingdom of Sicily. This is circa around 1231 to 1241. It is regarded as the document of foundation for the profession of pharmacists. For the first time, the activities of pharmacists and physicians are separated from one another in a very clear definition. Physicians should not run a pharmacist shop, whereas, uh, whereas medications should be produced only by a qualified pharmacist in his registered shop. These reflections formulated there are still to be found in our actual legislation today. Since the 14th century, the first public pharmacist shops can be shown to have existed in important German capitals, uh, capital cities like Heidelberg or Lübeck. The increasing number of foundations of pharmacist shops is not least due to the rising needs of medications which were caused by the big epidemics like the plague that would come. So with this, you get the rise of the need of laws that are created around pharmacies because you had to, and pharmacists and doctors, where they actually had created laws to separate the two out, you know, because there was, you know, a lot of contradiction between both of them at times. So, you know, in order to best serve the public health, they separated the two out so that the public could best be served because there was a rising need of serious medical help and knowledge with the pandemics and the epidemics that would spread throughout the medieval world. In the developing town of the Middle Ages, you know, these reliable fundamental laws were vital, you know, to establish that proper medical care was given. You know, in the developing towns of the Middle Ages, official regulation for trade and public health was absolutely indispensable. The legal foundations could vary in different territories, but mostly the sovereign prince handed out a privilege or a permit for running a pharmacy. First testimonies of legislation for pharmacists in Germany appear in the Pharmacist Oath of Basel in the early 14th century and in the pharmacist oath of Nuremberg around 1350. It says that every pharmacist is to swear that he will prepare in any case that what was told or written to him to the rich and the poor without endangering them. He should take such payment as he makes a modest profit for his food, nourishment, and labor according to the time of his beginnings. So you see these fundamental things that we look at in medicine, these fundamental truths that, you know, all that doctors shall do no harm had its beginnings far back even in antiquity and was seen through all throughout the, Medi throughout the Middle Ages. This is why we consider in, in our modern world today, you know, some of the most highly, you know, uh, um, looked upon citizens in any population anywhere are doctors because they take that oath to do no harm, something that was written down in the Middle Ages. During the Renaissance era, we get a birth of human ideas. It's basically, you know, we're coming out of the, you know, the, the Middle Ages and our, our, ourselves as human beings are growing. And we're also looking at these trades like, you know, pharmacy, for example, and expanding and, and, and growing that. And because of that, new technologies developed that enabled, like the printing press, that enabled, you know, pharmacists to, to spread their knowledge to a wider audience. You know, humanism as an attitude of mind and individualism as an awareness of life characterized the Renaissance, the age of setting off into new worlds, but also the discovery of America extended the range of the resources of medicine with valuable medicinal plants from overseas like the China bark. The invention of letterpress printing in the middle of the 15th century opened absolutely new possibilities for the pharmacist. Herbals with partly outstandingly good illustrations of plants revolutionized the rapidly developing science of botany. The printing of bigger editions facilitated the introduction and the circulation of pharmacopias. In 1546, the town council of Nuremberg got the Dispenser, dispensatorium of Valeris printed and obligated the pharmacist of the town to apply it. So they basically created the first German pharmacopoeia. 
This exemplary work was distributed in large parts of Europe by various new editions and reprints and became an example for collections of prescriptions. The use of largely the same instructions of, prepar of preparation contributed much to the standardization of the prescriptions. So what you see is, is in the Renaissance, you not only have you know, the birth of looking at the world differently, but you also have the birth of, you know, and the growth of, of medicine, of pharmacy as a science because of the technology that was present during the time, meaning the printing press and the availability to share those ideas to a wider audience. Before the end of the 18th century, the diagnosis of medicine was based in two doctrines. You had the doctrine of signatures, which basically your disease looked like what is in nature that can cure you, and the doctor's doctrine of the four humors. You know, you have blood, black bile, urine, and phlegm, and the balance of those. If one of them was out of balance, then it would cause an illness. So to get you out of that illness, you would get them back in balance. Hence, bleeding is a great example uh, you see uh, in all kinds of art in the... 16th, 17th, 18th century of people being bled. Well, that was for the doctrine of humors to balance. That meant you have too much blood, so you would drain some of that blood out in order to balance you out and to get you healthy again. The theory of the four humors originated with Hippocrates. The Roman physician Galenios extended it decisively. With a few additions in the Middle Ages, it stayed the basis of medicine and pharmacy really up and through just about the birth of the modern age. According to this theory, four humors have an effect in the human body. Blood, film, phlegm, yellow, and black bile. An equilibrium of all humors was regarded as an ideal condition. Uh, human beings are healthy having balanced of humors. They are ill if they have a disequilibrium. Too much or too little has occurred within the body. One of the primary qualities, warm, cold, moist, dry, and one of the four seasons were also related to each of these humors as well as one of the four elements, fire, water, earth, and air. Soon the patients were divided into four temperance Signotic, phlegmatic, chorotic, and melancholic, with the relations to the planets, signs of the zodiac, and of the zodiacs. So basically, what you have to understand is, is that these are people without scientific equipment, without microscopes or or any ability to test things, trying to figure out and understand human health and how to cure with what they know and understand and see in the world around them. Uh, primitive, yes, but I mean, it's how things were diagnosed for many, many, many centuries. You know, you were trying to make sense out of the chaos. And so the balancing of these humors were one of the things. It's the same thing. It's like with the, um, with the, uh, the signatures, you are looking at a disease. Well, maybe something that looks like that disease out in nature can cure you. It's a reasonable idea to you know, or to men of that time, but one in which we know is absolutely ludicrous today. To know the relation of the primary qualities of cold, warm, dry, and moist to every medication and food was important to the pharmacist up to the 16th and 17th century. He chose the remedies which would have an opposite effect against the nature of illness because of their qualities. In a simplified way, we can describe therapy at this time, which had no knowledge of blood circulation, bacteria, or any of their transferences like that. If the nature of the illness was recognized as warm, medication with the quality cold was given. Preventive administration of laxative remedies was a cleansing effect was also frequent. They should free the body like the bloodletting from too much of one or the other humor, and that would have a positive effect on their equilibrium. Other circumstances had to, of course, be taken into consideration too. For example, the age of the patient or the season. What was useful for a young patient could be harmful to an old one. When that was considered healthy in winter because it caused much damage in spring. So basically, you had a very complicated process, you know, using the knowledge at the time to try to understand what was wrong with the body. And this is something that maintained until really the birth of scientific equipment where we could actually look and study and see bacteria and 
see why the human body was getting ill and sick and then come up with more advanced methods of treatment like we have in modern medicine today. Medical treatment was broken up into three major kingdoms. You had plant material, you had animal bones, parts, materials, oils, and you also had mineral materials such as copper or sulfur or lead. These materials were then combined in order to create the medicines that you would take uh, from as far back as antiquity all the way up into the 19th century and the advent of modern medicine. In this room, we've got some fantastic examples of several different of, of the three kingdoms, some examples that show the different minerals, the different plants, and the different animal parts and substances, and some of them are going to surprise you because they're quite fascinating. A lot of the plants that were used in medicinal practices and were used by pharmacists have been tried and trues for millennia. Some things actually worked. And some things really didn't work, but you know, you had the placebo effect going on. They really thought and assumed that they worked. Plants like this behind me, pomegranate and rhododendron, were good for deworming agents. You know, these were tried and true methods. They knew that this worked. They didn't exactly know why it worked, but they just knew that it worked. And this was how the knowledge was built over time, you know, tried and true methods. Um, there are other plants that were used, and we're going to show you some of those here in a second. Some other plants that were really common and really commonly used that even still today we still use are plants like peppermint. Uh, peppermint was used for colics or cramps, stomach cramps. Uh, another thing is a nerve agent like cannabis or India hemp. That was used as, as, a, as a mild sedative uh, back then just as it is today, recreationally at least. But these are some more examples of some plants that were used uh, in pharmaceutical medicine of the time because you're talking about they didn't have you know synthetic medicines they had to go out and collect the plants and these are the plants that they collected and used also within plants were ones that were used that had magic powers or magical abilities these are unusual plants rare plants like the mandrake here this is an unusual plant because the root itself actually looks like the human body and therefore it was believed that it could cure a lot of things in the human body. So it was added to all kinds of stuff, but mainly it was used as an aphrodisiac. You know, there was a legend that was very prominent and the illustration behind us shows it that if you dug up a mandrake and you pulled it out, that it would scream and the scream would be so powerful that it would actually kill you. So one of the things that they would do is, is they would dig a hole around the plant and then tie a rope to the plant itself and then tie a rope to a dog. And then you, the person who didn't want to die, would sneak away and then call your dog. As the dog would chase after you, it would yank the, plank, the plant up, the plant would then shriek, kill the dog and you would be fine and you would get your plant. This is something that was actually done during that period and this is a great illustration of it behind us. Um, some other plants that were used down here are these marine balls. These are parts of fibrous material from marine plant life such as seaweed that the wave action in the ocean has tumbled into these little tiny balls. These were broken apart and used for all kinds of things, all kinds of cure-alls. So within the plant kingdom, within our three kingdoms, the minerals, the animals, and the plants, they had things that you know, were rare and special that they would add to other medicinal plants to create a very special tonic that could cure whatever ails you. But some of the most interesting ones are in the animal kingdom, and I know you want to see that, so let's go check that out. Another one of the three kingdoms in medical cures is the kingdom of animals. This is where certain animal parts and pieces, including that of human beings, were used in order to mix with plants and other things like minerals in order to create cure-alls uh, in the pharmacy. And there's a lot of very interesting animal parts that were used, some of them quite mythological. There was really not a lot that could be at least medically speaking, that, that could work from animals other than fat. The fat that was rendered from certain animals could be mixed with plants to make topical creams, things like that, or stuff that actually worked. But there were things like um, teeth and bones that were ground up that were used and mixed in that actually had absolutely no purpose whatsoever. But you know, you've got to keep in mind they're working on a principle of if it looks like the part that is hurting, it's going to cure you. So for example, if you had a toothache 
you would ground up a boar's tooth, mix it with some other plants and animal herbs, and then adhere that to your tooth, and that would then cure you. This is the mindset of medical science at the time, you know? And what, one of the things to really think about is, is, you know, this is something that was thought of and believed 250, 300 years ago. That's not that far away. Uh, bacteria, for example, you know, we didn't know about bacteria until after the American Civil War, so the in, middle of the 19th century. And that's because the technology hadn't come about in order to really see and understand how the human body works and what is out there in the natural world that can actually help cure it. But just like we were talking with plants, there were also the magical cures, and I want to show you some of those magical cures. What's behind me is probably the, the most powerful, and because it is the most powerful, it is also the most expensive medical remedy of the day, at least in the animal kingdom, and that is unicorn horn. And yes, you heard me correctly, unicorn horn. So what they would do is, is they, they had access to narwhal tusk, basically from the Arctic. And so you had you know, someone that could obtain a narwhal tusk, bring it down, and the majority of people, 99.9% .9 of people have never heard of, never seen a narwhal. So you could create this story about this unicorn and how this ground up horn can cure you. Kind of like how rhino horn is used in Eastern medicine today. Um, you know, there's no effect to it, but it's that placebo effect that works. What they were also using is, is if the unicorn, or if, if the narwhal tusk or horn wasn't available, they would take mammoth tusk or mammoth ivory. And back behind me are actual pieces of mammoth ivory, probably collected near locally, that would have been ground up and used. But this was the most expensive treatment, and it was a basic cure-all. So you would take whatever you were, you know, let's say you, you have, were having liver failure, you would take the plants that you would need to order to help your liver, add a little unicorn powder to it, add an upcharge, and that was the magic cure-all because it was the super rare thing. So within all of these kingdoms, and really within a lot of pharmacy at this, at, at this day, you see a lot of things that kind of make sense, but you also see a lot of things that absolutely do not make any sense. And that was just, you know, the furtherment of our knowledge at that period of time. Another really common uh, animal part that was used was actually human bone, uh, particularly skull bone, like this skull cap we've got here. So remember, you know, things that can, that look like what's hurting you can cure you. So if you had a head injury, let's say, or you had a headache, if you were to ground up a bit of a human skull, mix it in with the other things, and then take that, that would aid in the relievement of your headache or your skull injury or what have you. The human skulls that were collected were those of people who were uh, criminally charged and criminally executed. Uh, they would take the skull cap, the top part of it, and ground it into a powder where it would then be mixed up with stuff. So, I mean, even things as, you know, as fascinating as unicorn horn or narwhal tusk uh, were used, things as macabre as actual human cranium were ground up, used, and then ingested. And that was a very common part of medical practice in the period. Another part of the animal that was used were these uh, glands within animals. The civet cat, for example, was used, it had a gland that secreted a substance. That substance was then used for cramps, also as a stimulating agent. Another animal part that was used were the castor glands out of the beavers. Those were used for epilepsy or for hysteria, or if you got hysterical, you would take some of the castor gland out of the beaver and you would use it. Uh, another thing is ambergris out of sperm whales, out of the skull of a sperm whale. This was used as an ingredient in perfume, uh, not to smell, but just in order to make perfume, you used it. It was also used as a tooth powder or a toothpaste to help sore teeth. These are some of the more common, more eccentric things that were used in order to cure you. Some of the other animal parts that were used were skinks. Uh, these little lizards were ground up completely into a powder and were used as an aphrodisiac. Uh, even insects were used, uh, like flies, for example, Spanish fly, and not the one that you're thinking of in the grocery store. This is literally a fly from Spain, Spanish fly. Uh, it was used in ground up, and it was used as a topical uh, stimulant to, uh, to irritate the skin. Uh, these are some of the common things used. Even roly-polies were used. So it's not just these large animals that were used in the animal kingdom for medical treatment, but also insects and 
other smaller animal and other smaller life forms as well. The third and final kingdom that was used is that of the mineral kingdom, where specific minerals were used, mixed in with animal and plant substances in order to make what cure you. And just like within animals and plants, if it kind of looked like, you know, it like, for example, you, if you had a red iron or something like that, you, if you had red swelling on your arm, you could use that because the red swelling matched the red that was rock. So it's that mindset of if it looked like what was wrong with you, it could help cure you. Uh, some common things were silver was used as a cure for syphilis. Uh, copper was very commonly used. Copper, of course, will you know, kill anything. And so they would mix copper in with certain substances as well. But it's this idea that, you know, all kingdoms of the earth, animals, plants, rocks, and minerals had the ability to cure you. And this is, you know, going back to antiquity all the way up until the 19th century, which is not very long ago, using these types of cures in order to heal the human body. By the 18th century, you have the advent of public pharmacies, basically where a doctor would prescribe you, you know, what you needed, and you would go to a pharmacist, a public pharmacist, in order to fill your prescription, much like we have today. And this is an exact recreation with original artifacts of a pharmacy from the 18th century. You can see the lady in the window with her prescription in hand. She would come, the pharmacist would go look and see what was wrong and then collect the necessary herbs and create what you needed in order to cure yourself. One interesting fact though, if you look up, you'll see an alligator hanging there and you see a, a puffer fish back in the background back here. And over in the corner over here is an actual narwhal's tusks. These things were used as kind of advertisements in a way. What they would do is, is they would show these very exotic things because keep in mind, they're using exotic animal parts as part of their cure-alls. They're also using exotic plants. And so if in your pharmacy shop, you show alligators and puffer fish, things that people don't normally see, that's a form of advertising to show that you really know what you're doing because you have access to those things. This is a wonderful example of an 18th century pharmacist shop, uh, one that was beautifully built here and something you can check out and see anytime. Behind me is an example of an 18th century monastic pharmacy. Now, the monasteries at the time were really the storehouses of knowledge going from you know, the transition phase from the Roman period all the way up to the medieval, because this is where the literate people lived. And because this is where literacy was held, this is also where you know, medical knowledge was also stored and used. So a pharmacy like this would not only serve the uh, monastery itself, but also the surrounding communities. And it was also the church's way to reach out to the community. You know, if they could heal their body, maybe they could heal their soul. So it was a really good thing for monasteries to have these pharmacies like this. Behind me is an example of a late 18th, early 19th century pharmacist shop. This is where the actual herbs themselves were processed and used. Up to the 19th century, two rooms in a pharmacist shop served mainly as storerooms for substances which were not kept in the official pharmacist shop itself. The material or herb room des it was designed to store substances that had to be kept dry in the cellars of medicines to keep them cool. As a result of industrialization, it got increasingly important to store properly the finished medications produced by pharmaceutical enterprises. But since the 16th century, pharmacist shops had to store the substances which were listed in the pharmacy's marcopias. Native plants could be cultivated in their own pharmacy garden or could be brought in by merchants. Substances were once or twice a year offered at big fairs like the one in Frankfurt or markets involving several regions. There were several special tools of whom which show a selection of the pounding and cutting and processes of how to, how to process these plant and animal and mineral drugs. During the 18th and 19th century, pharmacist shops got their materials increasingly from the wholesale business and drugs which were emerging. The fully stocked pharmaceutical wholesale trade of today you know, almost disappeared. Uh, caused by its readiness of immediate delivery first, the necessity and then the legal regulation became uh, very important to store all kinds of medical substances for several months. The actual regulations for chemist shops 
uh, got very complicated. And this is where you see rooms like this start to disappear, is at that time, being in the middle of the 19th century. As drugs and medicine became more complicated, you needed complicated methods in order to store them. And so storehouses and processing rooms like this were really a thing of the past. This is a beautiful recreation of an 18th century, 19th century pharmacist shop. This has been a really interesting look at medicine throughout ages. You know, one of the big points that I want to get across to everybody, to all you guys out there, is, is that, you know, we think we're so advanced in the 21st century with modern medical techniques, but when you look at the history of medicine, we're actually not that far away from some really crazy ideas. I mean, up until the, you know, 19th century, they were still practicing the balancing of the humors and actually bleeding people to balance the humor at, humors out. You know, even during the Civil War, doctors were doing that practice because they thought it worked. George Washington died because of it. So we're not as far apart from these medical practices as we may think. But we're making a lot of progress. And as time goes on, we're making even more progress. But it's really important to take the time to look back in history just to see how far we've come. And I have really enjoyed this look at pharmacy throughout all of time. If you have an opportunity, come to Heidelberg. Come check out the National Museum of Pharmacy. This is an incredible site. It's literally in the middle of a castle. <laughs> like, how cool is that? It's in the middle of a castle. So you get to see a cool castle and get to see an amazing museum. We'll have some information up at the end of this episode where you can go check that out, where you can call, look online. They've got a lot of these displays are in English. So if you get an opportunity to visit Southwest Germany, come to Heidelberg and check this out. For right now, I want to thank you guys very much for checking out Chasing History. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe. Share it to a friend. Throw some comments down below. Let us know how we were doing. Let us know if there's some things that you would like us to work on or change. We're open to that. And if you get an opportunity, just check out some really cool history. I promise you, you don't have to come all the way to Germany to find cool history. If you go to your local town, you, I guarantee you, you're going to find something that is going to blow your mind. So thank you guys for watching, and remember, history rocks. Third and find them. Hold on, hold on, hold on.